Uh, Les Peters M1 MD is a quite a popular contest here. Uh, if you like to operate the GX contest from the island of Bermuda, in many of those contests, he is the only station operating from Bermuda with the game is out all the time. And he's going to talk about that. So this is a, a this is a presentation that I originally gave at the Yankee Clipper Contest Club. It's been updated a little bit. Um, so VP9I is the club call for the Bermuda DX Club, and so um, you hear it a lot in contest. When you when you operate from Bermuda in the contest, that's what you'll hear. Outside of the contest, it'll be your home call, VP9 stroke your home call. Um, a lot of people op operate from there. It's, it's a lot of fun. So Bermuda is, uh, you know, about 800 miles from, from Boston. Uh, it's, uh, about 20 square miles. Um, that's about five times the, the area of Nantucket. Um, where I operate from is, uh, uh, on the western side of the, of the island, Hamilton Parish. Um, it's about two hours by plane to, to get there. Um, it's a, it's, the people are nice. Everything's imported basically. So everything's expensive. Uh, one of the interesting things is that the import duty on a car is 100%. So if you, if you want to go and, and buy a $30,000 car in the States and bring it over, it's going to cost you $30,000 to bring it over. They don't want cars over there. There just isn't that much room. And the people who drive cars, they drive these little compact cars unless you have a business. All right. Um, the first question I usually get asked is, how the heck did I get mixed up in operating from Bermuda? So uh, in the mid-2000s, uh, I, I was quite active contesting from home and, and quite successful in the CQ Worldwide Phone Contest. Uh, even got a couple of plaques for winning no North America. Um, and after that, I wanted to find a new challenge. So I knew a, a bunch of uh, Yankee Clipper Contest Club members would travel abroad for these contests. And, and one of them was my friend W6PH, uh, who's a retired airline pilot. And he would operate from Bermuda every spring, the ARRL uh, DX phone and C CW contest. And so I, I contacted him and said, hey, how do you do this? And so he sort of mentored me a little bit on, on how to do this. Um, there's a, a, a cottage business of DX rentals where people will rent their station out. Um, sometimes there's an attached apartment. Sometimes it's, it's a whole house that you, that you rent. And the neat thing is you go there and you don't need any antennas. You basically show up with your radio and connect it up and there you go. So it's a, a great way of doing like a mini de-expedition. And so I got hooked up with that in, in 2010. So, you know, when I was talking to Kurt trying to figure out how to do this, you know, uh, he, he was very helpful in, in cluing me into what he did. And so I took his lead. So getting licensed in Bermuda is really easy. You go to the, uh, the Radio Authority Bureau. Uh, they have a website. Uh, and you fill in a form. You upload your U.S. license. Uh, and a couple of days later, you get your license. It's really that easy. Uh, and the, the frequency uh, allocation is very similar to Europe. That is to say, some of the, 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 the phone frequencies are below the U.S. hand band. So, like, if you ever notice the Europeans, they can transmit below, say, 7125 on the 40-meter band. Well, in Bermuda, you can do the same thing. And then I'll talk a little bit about that later. You also are limited to 150 watts output, uh, unless you get some sort of special license, which I, I, I never did. Um, one of the first things uh, I learned is how to travel light. So um, what, what Kurt did, and, and I sort of mimicked this, is you bring your radio as carry-on. You don't check your radio. Why do you do that is, you know, if for some reason the radio gets broken along the way, you become nothing but a tourist. And so that's, that's, that's not advisable. So um, let's see. So over here is the radio. It's about three quarters of my carry-on. Um, I usually pack like maybe three 
three days worth of clothes around it. And then over here is the backpack, the same one I have here. Matter of fact, this is from my last trip and I haven't even unpacked it yet. But so this is, whoops. So this is basically what I bring. The, the carry-on goes in the overhead and the, and the backpack goes in the seat, uh, below the seat in front of me. Um, so you, you really learn to travel light. Well, what is the minimum that you have to bring? Um, some of the lessons that I learned doing this are when I first started doing this, JetBlue had a policy that they would board the plane from the back. And so if I wanted to be assured of getting overhead space, I was just purchase a ticket in the back of the plane and I, I would always have space. Well, then Jiplu decided to change their, their, the way they board the plane, and now they're just like anybody else. So that, that sort of screwed me. Um, then uh, I started buying these extra legroom seats, the emergency rows. And the thing there is they allow you to get on the plane before the general public. So that's what I've been doing now. So, you know, the idea is that if, if you can't get overhead space, you're screwed. If, if, if I end up having to take that radio and check the bag, I'm going to be a tourist because I'm going to be like, I'll be shaking the radio and like listening for all the rattles. It, it will not work. So um, now Delta does something similar. They have their comfort plus seats right after first class. And so these are a handful of rows that allow you to get on the plane before the general public. And so that's another way. Uh, I only got, um, I only got in trouble once. So uh, if you remember Hurricane Sandy, I was in Bermuda. And my flight back got, got canceled because it was through JFK, and JFK was underwater. So I'm like, oh, darn, i got to stay in Bermuda a couple more days. Of course, my host was just going out of his mind because he had somebody coming in the following week. And uh, I ended up getting on a, as a standby on a, on a flight through Atlanta. When I got on the plane, they, there was no overhead space, and I pleaded with the flight attendant that I had this very expensive radio, and I, um, you know, we have to do something. And so they agreed. Uh, they have a, I guess, a cabinet for the for the the crew, uh, where they they put clothes and things like that. And they allowed me to put the radio in there. Took it out of the the carry on, put it in there. And of course, she says we take no responsibility for what happens. But that's that's the only time that I ever had a problem. So, so, yes. So uh, the question is, is how much are, uh, is, is airfare? It, it really depends. Um, when I go in the springtime, it's probably in the, I don't know, four or $500 a range. When I go in the fall, it's considerably more, maybe $800, something like that. All right. Um, this is Ed, VP9GE. He is the nicest man you'll ever meet. Uh, he is a longtime resident of the island. He has dual citizenship. He's lived in, uh, in Massachusetts on the South Shore for years as well. Um, this is a picture taken a few years back. He's in his mid-90s now. Uh, and he runs this rental business. Uh, he rents the two apartments out below his house. And he's got antennas, and he, and he on the, the left apartment, he runs it basically the, the cables so that you can you use his antennas, the rotor box, and he has a power supply that you can, you can utilize. His service basically is about $170 a night. He picks you up at the airport, will stop at a market on the way so he can get provisions for your trip. Uh, he'll bring you back to the airport if you need to go into town, and, and he's going that way, he'll, he'll do that. Usually one of the things that I do is, is after the contest ends, I have them take me down to the Swizzle Inn. The Swizzle Inn is about five minutes away. It's this restaurant and bar, and they make really good rum swizzles. So I sort of like have dinner after, and, and, and that's a fun thing to do. But, you know, Ed is, the hospitality is unparalleled. He's a really great guy. And, and as far as DX Rentals, he's, I think, the only one I know of that rents by the day. Everybody else rents by the week. So I show up on like a, a Thursday and I leave on a Monday. So this is the view from uh, Ed's place, uh, Northwest toward uh, North America. You notice he's up really high, he's up on a ridge. This is about 150 meters from the ocean. 
Uh, and this is a great location for working the states because um, the states are like 800 miles that way. Uh, his antennas are basically the high band antennas. The primary one is this tri-bander, the A4S, which is three elements on 20 and 15 and four on 10. And in the background, you can see uh, Yagi's for six and two meters. Uh, Ed is typically active on all these bands. Uh, I've worked them uh, up through six meters. I haven't worked around two meters yet, but you know, I wanna see if I can talk them into working meteor scatter on two meters. That, I think that would be a lot of fun. Um, he, not shown here is a, a fan dipole he uses for 12, 17, and 30 meters. If I get on the work bands, that's what I use. And so uh, you notice that the, the tri-bander is on a 25-foot tower. You think to yourself, geez, that's not very high. But remember the shot before I showed you looking northwest? It looks really high. And in other directions, it's not too bad either. Uh, but his low band antennas are a bunch of dipoles. This is a photo that shows his uh, inverted L he used to have. He no, no longer uses that. He's replaced that by, a, by a, a dipole. So he's got dipoles on 40, 80, and 160. So you can see the 40 meter dipole. This, this thing is, you think to yourself, it's just a dipole. But I'll work like a thousand people during the weekend in, in the contest with 100 watts, you know. I'll be running North Americans like crazy. And 80 meters, 80 meters works pretty well. Um, 160 meters when you're, when you're trying to work Europeans with 100 watts, that can be a challenge, especially on phone. So what, what ends up happening is you, you work a handful of like the biggest stations. These are the ones with the huge antennas and the, the long beverages, but you can work a handful of them. So my comment is, is that when you're the only multiplier on 160 for the European stations, they're as interested in working you as you are in working them. And the VP9 call is an extra 10 dB. I always say that you get an extra 10 dB by, by having that call sign. So this is looking toward Europe, by the way. He's got a little bit of an incline getting, getting, getting toward Europe. Um, but like I say, to the States, it's phenomenal. So uh, there's a reason why Kurt W6PH operated the ARRL contest for so many years in a row. He's no dummy. So this is Ed's house looking from the front. The, the top floor is basically the private residence. And this is where he rents to, uh, to Ham's. Um, this apartment, uh, he had been renting, now his, his daughter uh, lives there. Um, you can see some of his antennas in the back. But uh, this, is, this is it. It's a, you know, it's a decent place. So this is looking uh, at the apartment on the inside. Again, it's very basic. It's got all the amenities. It's clean. Uh, the, the inset here is basically what you see looking out that door. That's not a bad view every morning, except for that house. So this is my operating position. I have my same laptop I have here, uh, TS2000. This is an older photo, this is from 2010. And the uh, ironic thing is uh, a DVK, which I didn't have this time. Um, this is the stuff that he provides. DVK for everybody. A, a digital keyer. voice keyer. So the question is, what's a DVK? A di a digital voice keyer. Um, why is that important, Les? Uh, because you won't lose your voice. <laughs> so things like automated, like CQing, yes. that kind of thing. You, you pre-record. You, you pre-record your messages here. Typically, I will record things like CQ contest, and like if, if I'm SNP and giving my call once or twice, uh, the exchanges are so fast uh, that I don't usually use it for exchanges because it's like uh, K1BG595. And then it's thanks, Victor Papan in India. I mean, it goes that fast. So it's too fast to, to use it for that.
I don't know if you've, you've found the same. Oh, I found exa exa exactly the same. Okay. But it's, if you're running, okay, then it's too fast, okay? Yeah. But if you're, if you're calling other people, it's different. And programming the exchanges and the calls right. and all of that is really easy. Right. Um, sort of a, a funny story about this map. So this is in 2010. This is the first year uh, that I went there. Now, Ed has a habit of like, uh, he likes to listen to you operate. He's very interested in how you're doing, and he's extremely helpful. So I, rem I remember operating in, in the Seek Your Worldwide Phone Contest, uh, the exchange is your zone. Well, I'm in zone five. But I remember working at W4 somewhere, and... He didn't know his zone, and I didn't know his zone either. And I'm fumbling around trying to figure out what his zone is. And no more than five minutes later, Ed comes down and puts that map up for me. It's like, I'm like, the guy has got ESP. Do you have a question? Okay. So some general operating comments. Um, it's really interesting being on the other side of the pileup. I'm used to being the hunter, not the hunted. You know, trying to break the pile up, trying to figure out the operating habits of the DX station, timing, things like that. And being the DX is, is a thrill. It's also very challenging because you have like all these people calling you at once and typically they're all the same signal strength. And it's difficult with the QRM to be able to pick out a call sign. And what will happen is I'll be trying to work somebody and the people will be trying to call me. And the, the person I'm trying to work can't hear me. So wh what we end up doing is working split. So I'll be like listening up five kilohertz or listening down five kilohertz. And I'll announce that, you know, listening up five. And so the people will call me up five. And hopefully what that does is it clears out my transmit frequency. Uh, and, and, and so we can, we can work. But what happens is great. So I've moved the pile up, but it's still a huge pile up at five kilohertz. I'm still having a hard time. You know, the W3 echo type of thing. So then I'll say, uh, I'm listening to five to 10 up and I'm hoping I'm, I'm going to spread out the pile up. And inevitably what happens is you get a pile up at five and you get a pile up at 10. So I end up working people at, at five. And then when I can't work anybody at five, I'll tune up to 10 and I'll go back and forth. And the savvy DXers will go, well, now, I'm having a hard time working at 5 or 10, but, you know, there's not a whole lot of people in the middle. And that's smart because I'll end up finding them as I go from 5 to 10 and back. So, you know, there's lessons like this that you can learn being the DX station that will make you a better DXer. So I, I just thought that that was interesting. Um, people who go to Bermuda don't go to work the work bands. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right, but the problem is, is, is if there are a lot of people calling me on that same frequency and I can't hear them, well, and they know I'm listening up 5 to 10 and they're at 5, somebody will call me at 10. Somebody will try to call me somewhere else where it's clear in the range I'm listening because they know if they keep calling, they're not getting through. Maybe they've called 10 times and it just isn't working, that they're, they're, they're going to try something different. That's the, the savvy DXer. DXer. On, on, on CW, Dennis, okay, that's very true. You can do a lot more on CW by finding out where they're transmitting. With, with dual receiver. But, right, but on phone, where you have a 2.1 or a 2.4 kilohertz bandwidth, Everybody is sharing that same bandwidth. It's right. not like there are a few hertz different in each station calling. It's much more difficult to, to be successful doing that on phone. So uh, also, people don't go to work the work bands. They go to work the contest. So if you want to work Bermuda on a standard band, get in any contest. There's always going to be somebody there. But if you want to work uh, somebody from Bermuda on the work bands, that's really difficult. You got to get them basically be, before a contest. So typically what I'll do is I'll try to get on and spend some time before the contest or the day before if, if I can. And, and man, you become really popular. This time when I was there, I was on 12 meters. Man, it was crazy. The Europeans were nuts. Um, 
and working FT8. I'm, I'm not a big fan of FT8, um, but I, I'll get on and I'll, I'll give out some contacts. FT8 is like one of those things that you can do while you're having dinner or while you're calling home to see how the family is. You know, it's like, um, yep, okay, yep, got it. Um, but I will say that one of the interesting things that I, I like to try if I get a chance to go back is there's a program called MSHV where you can have up to four streams going at the same time on the same frequency. You can actually work four people simultaneously. Of course, you can't do it on, on a standard like FDA frequency, so you gotta, you gotta pick one that's a little bit off, and then you gotta probably have somebody spot you so that they know where to go because people, it's a non-standard frequency. But I think that might be interesting to try. That, that sort of piqued my interest. Contest. So this is the reason I go to Bermuda. While I, well, while I like, like to operate casually, casual running, uh, this is the real reason I go. So when I first started going in 2010, it was for the CQ Walleye phone contest. And um, I, I, I like that contest because it's the biggest one there is. It's the most popular. It's got the most people. It's the world works the world. Um, and also because W6PH was doing the, the ARRLDX contest like for probably 20 years. And, uh, and I couldn't get that slot. Well, during the pandemic, he stopped going to Bermuda. And late in the pandemic, I started doing that contest. And the contest is quite different than CQ Worldwide. In CQ Worldwide, you work everybody. Everybody works you, all the different countries. So you got to learn about propagation to all those different areas. You got to learn about, you know, when to change bands, you know, Things like, uh, what, you know, where am I going to get the most points and when? You know, um, ARRL is different. You basically, point your antenna west and leave it there. And, and this time, uh, Ed's rotor was broken. And I said, that's okay, just point it west. So that's what he did. And you only need to wor worry about propagation to the states, to, to, to North America. Because the contest is the U.S. and Canada works the world. And the world works U.S. and Canada. And I, I showed you that, that shot of, you know, the, the shot to North America from Ed's place. Friggin' incredible location for that. It's like shooting ducks in a, you know, it's crazy. It's cheating. It's almost cheating. Um, so they're, they're distinctly different contests. And, and ARRL is a hell of a lot easier from there than Seeker Worldwide. Um, the value in using the VP9 iCall. The first year that I went in 2010, I used my call. So in the contest, I'm saying, CQ contest, Victor Papa 9 stroke, November 1, Sugar Victor. Because it's a real tongue twister. Uh, and after that, I started using Victor Papa 9 India. It's a hell of a lot better. So um, fewer people got screwed up, fewer points deleted. Um, trying to control the, the European pileups. This is challenging. For whatever reason, the Europeans don't like to pay attention. I don't know if it's the language barrier. I don't know if it's something else. But, you know, you'll, I'll say I mean, I'm, I'm looking for the IT3. And anything that, that begins with I will call me. And some things that don't even begin with I, like, like Sugar Mike. It's, it's crazy. But um, it's, a, it's a challenge trying to control the European pileups. And if you don't, your rate suffers. Um, running below the U.S. phone band. I, I mentioned this before about the license. So the license, you, you basically have the allocation of the Europeans. One of the problems that you have is you're so close to the to U.S. and Canada that when you're trying to work Europe, and the window to Europe isn't that big, when you're trying to work Europe and you're pointing your beam toward Europe, Guess what? All the Americans are calling you off the back, and they're stronger. Okay, so you want to work Europe because you're, you're getting more points for the Europeans. It's a different continent. And what you're working is mostly getting covered up by the state side, and you're thinking, well, I'll just work the state side, and eventually they'll go away. They don't go away. So the tactic is basically to run below the U.S. phone band. So like on... On, on 20 meters, I'll operate below 14,150. 
and the U.S. stations can't go there. Canadians can, but the U.S. stations can't go there. So I will run Europe as long as I can till a pileup dies. I'll do the same thing on 15 meters, and and then I'll come up into the U.S. phone band when, like, after noontime, after 1 o'clock when the band dies. And by this time, the U.S. stations have been chomping at the bit so bad that by, by the time I get up there and I call CQ, I have the world's largest pileup. And it's crazy. Crazy. So, Les, how many people are there like me, okay, who just point and click and call uh, from uh, out, calling outside the U.S.? You know, there are a handful of people that'll, that'll do that, and I'll say, you're operating outside the phone band, or I'll say nothing. If they continue to call, I'll say, you're outside of your band, and I won't work them. Even if it's like, uh, say, 7120, and that they're, 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 they're just below. Yeah. That's that's outside of the band. Even if it's seventy-one twenty-three, you're outside of your band because I'm not getting any points for that. I'm not going to promote that. That's just wrong. So I'll come up into the U.S. phone band after the after Europe dies, and like I said, it is just bedlam. I'll be working people as fast as I can. I've had rates of over three hundred for a solid hour or more. You know that's five a minute for for a long period of time not like 10 minutes it's like for an hour or 90 minutes it's, it's just incredible and by the time you, you you run out of people to work it's both an adrenaline rush and extremely fatiguing you know and finally you can take a breath and then you'll like if you do that on 15 meters you go all right let's go to 20 meters and it'll be like that all over again um it's it's nuts um, but that's, that's the way to solve that problem is to run below the U.S. phone BN. It doesn't work for ARRL, obviously, because you want, you want to work the Americans. That's, that's the purpose of the contest. Um, tackling 40 meter split operation. This is really hard. It's really confusing because I'll be in Bermuda and I'll be, I'll be down low where the Europeans are and I'll be listening up at like 7204 and I'll also be listening down low because you know, uh, if, if for Seeker Worldwide, I'll be wanting to work Europeans and North Americans. Well, guess what? I'm not the only one doing that. Nobody knows what frequency they're on. So somebody, I could be sharing my receive frequency with another, another European. So you, you, you do things like timing. How do I know he came back to me? Is it when I finished my transmission, did he come right back to me? Was there a delay? And then you got the, the U.S. stations that are doing just the opposite. They're up at 72 something or other, and they're listening down low. And, and it's crazy. So a lot of times you'll ask, how is my transmit frequency? Uh, you know, and, and it's really, it's just difficult. So I'll usually get on like the night before and try to practice a little bit. Um, but if you're going to be successful, you're going to turn into a good score. Mm -hmm. You got to learn how to do that. And it's not easy. Um, the value in getting spotted. This is incredibly important. So I can remember tuning around, trying to start a run. Yeah, this frequency is, I think this is open enough for me. I remember I'm only running, running 100 watts. I'm not that loud. And I'll, I'll try to start a run. I'll work a few people and then like nothing. I'll work a couple of people and then nothing. I'm like, oh, this is a waste. I'm not going to, this isn't working. Then all of a sudden, bam, a whole, whole bunch of people call me once and I go, ah, I got spotted. So it's really important to get spotted. It helps you out. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, does the, does the ARL allow self-spotting now? They One of them does. So I usually operate for ARL uh, uh, unassisted, uh, or no, un unlimited. Single operator, all being unlimited. So I think I can do that. So I started doing that, and... It pays big dividends. Um, so here's uh, some of my results for the CK World, Worldwide Phone Contest. So this is sort of interesting. Uh, uh, so this is the first year I went and noticed I used the VP9 stroke N1 SV call sign. Man, I made every mistake in the book. I made some I didn't even know I made. Uh, and it was just terrible. I remember Ed coming down going, what are you doing? You're, you know, 
come on. <clears throat> so at the end of the contest, I said to myself, all right, make a list of things that went well and things that didn't go well. <clears throat> and I said, Ed, can I come back in 2011 and, and, and sort of do better? And so I, I, pra I practiced things like, you know, running below the U.S. phone ban, trying to work split, things like that, you know, uh, learning more about the propagation from Bermuda, when to change bands, you know, knowing that um, you just can't hang on 20 meters forever. You know, you need to get, it needs to be fairly even. Uh, and so I came back in 2011 and I did a lot better. I worked, uh, I don't know, like seven, eight, seven, 800 more people broke into the top 10. You know, this is worldwide. And then I said, well, I think I can do better than that. And I, and I each year I got progressively better. And so I, fifth, third, and these asterisks basically mean that I, I broke a Bermuda record, a uh, longstanding Bermuda record for that category. And finally, in 2014, I broke over 4 million uh, in, in points, and but I only came in third. I got beat by th people like Papa 40 Whiskey, there was a ZF2, and I realized that while the, the Bermuda location is good, it's got some drawbacks. <clears throat> One of the draw, drawbacks is you're in zone five and you're considered North America. So guess what? North America doesn't help me. That becomes my biggest bucket of contacts. Yet what I really want is a different continent. In zone five, guess what? Most of the East Coast is zone five. So I realized that the people south of me, at the very least, were getting a, a different zone, zone eight, zone nine, things like that. And the ones really far south in the Caribbean, they were considered part of South America. They were cleaning up. So I realized that, you know, I'm never going to get any better than this. I'm not going to really win anything. So that was the last year that I, uh, that I did this. I did go back in, in 2018 with my good friend Ed Stratton, W1ZZ. We did a multi-single uh, you know, multi uh, effort there. And my goal was just have fun, share the operating and, and share uh, Bermuda with somebody else. And we had a lot of fun and we came in six. It wasn't so bad. And I brought them to the Switzerland after. Uh, and for whatever reason, you saw I, I, I came in third in 2014, yet somehow I got a plaque. How can you come in third and actually get a plaque? This is the plaque for Caribbean, Central America, single operator, all being low power. I don't know. But I got it. I, I can't explain it, but I got it. So this, this is ARRL, uh, DX phone results. So I started going in 2022. Now, 2022 was toward the end of the pandemic. Man, the hoops that I had to jump through to actually go to Bermuda were insane. So I, I had to get a COVID test. I had to have a positive COVID result before I could file my travel authorization for, the, for, the, for Ber Bermuda. They wouldn't let you into the country unless you got that authorization. Huh? A negative result, yeah. Correct. So I go down to CVS and I get my COVID hit test. Well, you don't get a result for 24 hours. It's not instant. So now the clock's ticking. I did it just inside 72 hours. So now I get my, my result. Now I'm just into 48 hours. Now I can upload my travel authorization request to Bermuda and hope they turn around fast enough. I mean, I've already bought my ticket and everything. I've already made my, my reservations. So luckily, like, you know, overnight, I get, my, I get my authorization returned. Lucky me. Now I can go to Bermuda. So I mask up. I go to Bermuda. What do you think happens the first time I, I, I get off the plane? They test you. They put a band on you that you can't take off until you get a result. And they basically sequester you. So I, I can't go to the market. Ed's got to go to the market for me. Ed picks me up at the airport, brings me to the house. I can't leave the house until the test comes back. So I, I get, you know, an email saying that I'm good. Now I can clip the thing off. But if I clip it off before then, you know, I can basically go to jail. So now I operate the contest. Well, the day before I leave to go home, guess what? I got to be tested again. So I, get, I go into Hamilton, Ed brings me into Hamilton, I get tested, and now we're waiting for the, for, the, for the results because if I get a positive result, I can't go back to the States. So I get a, a negative result. So now 
It's been four days. I've been tested three times. Now I, now I hop on the plane. I get, uh, go back to the States. I want to go back to work. But I need another test. So I've been gone five days. I've been tested four times. That's what it took to go there in 2022. So what did it yield? Actually, first place. I won the contest for the DX side of, of things. My first time out. And uh, I, was, I was very enthusiastic until I realized nobody sponsored a plaque for that category. So that, that was a bummer. Uh, I went back in 2023. I thought to myself, geez, I had so much fun here. Let's, let's do it again. And I don't know if propagation was off or I don't know. I was off, but I only came in second. But again, I had a lot of fun. And then this past year, I went um, and halfway through the contest, I lost my voice. I didn't have my, my DVK. I'm, I'm used to bringing my, my Elecraft K3S with me that has a built-in DVK. And I wasn't thinking. I took the TS-2000. I didn't take the DVK. And halfway through the contest, I, I completely lost my voice. Just couldn't go any farther. So that score is basically half a contest. And then the second half of the contest, I was a spectator. It's unfortunate. And I never, it took me about three weeks to get my voice back. And the irony is that if I had my DVK, I, I probably would have been okay. So that's unfortunate. And while I don't have a, a plaque for my 2022 result, you can see here, first place DX. Uh, and another country record. Um, so those are the results from Bermuda. Les, yeah. Can you, can you read that out loud what it says? Sure. This here? Okay. So this says the uh, ARL DX contest presented the VP9I operator N1SV. Uh, score uh, 3.069 million points, single operator, unlimited, low power, first place Bermuda, first place DX. So, yeah. So other things to, to see and do in Bermuda, I, I typically make it a habit of when I go to Bermuda, I try to do something besides radio. So uh, one year I went to the, the Royal Navy dockyard in Hamilton. This is sort of a neat place. Uh, it's a, 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 a place where during revolutionary times, they would uh, resupply and refit the British ships before they went back to fight the Americans. Now it's very touristy, but there's a, there's a museum and sort of a, a neat thing to do. You take the ferry from Hamilton across the bay to the dockyard. Uh, Front Street is the major street in Hamilton that faces the harbor. That's where all the bars and restaurants and shops are. So it's sort of fun to sort of walk back and forth there. Um, it, it's a neat place. I mentioned the Swizzle Inn. This is the oldest restaurant on the island. It's a lot of fun. You swagger up. I, I have the shirt, the Swizzle Inn, swagger up. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, walking around St. George's. So St. George's used to be the old capital of Bermuda. Uh, it's, on the, um, it, it's, it's on the other side of the airport. It's now Hamilton, but um, St. George's is really neat because uh, it's like walking back in time. All the streets are cobblestone. The architecture is really neat, you know, wonderful colors. There's a perfumery. If you're into that sort of thing, you can go tour it. Uh, it's, it's really a neat thing. Um, on the edge is uh, Fort St. Catherine, which is an old fort. Uh, and they made it into a museum, so there's a lot of neat things that you can look at in there. Um, you can also see the island via ferry. Now, I, I don't know if it's still true, but I used to go to the, um, the post office, and for four bucks, you'd get a, a bus token. And you could use it to, to basically take the bus from one end of the island to the other, or the ferry from one end of the island to the other. And the ferry and the buses are they're both pink. Um, so seeing the island via ferry is sort of neat. You get a different per perspective. Um, the Crystal Caves. So this is something that um, I didn't know about for a long time. But basically across the street from uh, Swizzle Inn are these caves that uh, they've cut steps in them. And uh, there's lights in them and there's, there's, there's water in the bottom of them. And uh, they're, they're basically natural caves. 
Uh, and you can walk down there and just sort of like take it all in, see the stalactites and the stalagmites and all that stuff. Um, Bermuda Aquarium. So this is one place I haven't been to. My, my problem with this is this is aquarium is like one of those things you do if it's raining. You know, if it's a nice day out, I want to do one of these other things. And I've yet to be in Bermuda when it's raining, so I've never gone there. There's multiple beaches to, to, to go to as well. The most famous is Horseshoe, Horseshoe Bay. Um, I've walked by there, but I'm not much of a beach person. I typically, um, I don't sit around much. I, I do a lot of things. So that's basically it. Any, any other questions? I have, I have a comment. Uh, when I was there, I, I met up with uh, two meters, you know, on Simplex. You don't know who you're going to come across. And I met up with uh, Dave Simmons, and uh, he's VP9KB, okay. Kilo Bravo, and he's the one who started the Bermuda... Um, DX Club? The DX Club there, or a different organization? Oh, okay. Society. The oh, okay. Bermuda right. Society. Right. And he and I and, uh, and Gene sat down, and we had breakfast, nice. and he bought breakfast for us. Nice. And was, They're really nice on the island. And, and he is also the man, single-handedly, who installed all of the telephones that are now presently working. He oh, was wow. the one who directed all the poles and all the wires, and he was frazzled after doing that. Uh, on two meters also, we met up with a, a VP9NJ, November Julia, yeah. and uh, it's, uh, that's a fellow named Manuel, and uh, he, he, he drives a truck, and his brother is a taxi cab driver, and I don't recall his name, VP9, uh, VP9KK, I think his call is. Yeah. And you just meet, the, these are all on Simplex. Yeah. So, so it's just a fun place. There's, also there's, there's some, some two meter and 440 repeaters there. there. You, you, really, really nice people. Uh, and, and it's just super, super nice people. So uh, they, the, there's a Bermuda dollar and it's pegged to the US dollar, but they'll take US money. Because it's, it's basically one to one. So like, I'll go there and of course I use credit cards these days, but I used to just like, if I was paying cash, I pay US cash and they're happy to take it. it it's on par. Uh, Les, a couple of questions. Question number one, you mentioned that the tower was 150 watts. Yes. Uh, they're a British uh, company, I guess. So a, a British territory, yes. British territory. So how much? How much of the laws are local, and how much are done by the, the uh, British uh, PPT, Post and Telegraph Office? And also, you know, the British have just changed the power limit from mm -hmm. 400 watts to a kilowatt. Um, do you think that they'll follow suit in the Bermuda? That's a good question. So uh, your first question, you know, is it, is it a, a UK thing or a, or a, a Bermuda thing? Basically, the way I understand it is any visitor going to the island is limited to 150 watts. If you live in Bermuda, that's different. There's, I don't know what the power level is. But you can also get, uh, and I haven't tried to do this because I really haven't had the need, you can also get a special operating permit that allows you to use more power. How much power, I don't know. Um, as far as like the changes in the, in the UK rules and what it means for B Bermuda, don't really know. And then my other question is, have you ever had competition during a contest? <clears throat> yes. From the island on the yes. How did that work? Not very well. <laughs> so uh, I think it was the first year I was there, uh, Alpha Alpha 4 Victor was there. And he was signing Alpha Alpha 4 Victor stroke VP9. And I was signing VP9 stroke N1SV. And so we ended up like splitting contacts. You know, uh, uh, when you're the only one on the island in the contest, it's like, guess what? You don't want to work the island, you have to work me. But when there's two people, now it's different. So th that, that didn't work that well. They were operating, I'm trying, trying to remember where they were operating from. Some rental house, they had set up antennas. Uh, I guess they do it a lot. There were, there were a couple of them. They, go, they had told me they went to Israel operating, and they basically said, uh, um, have Ed take you to the Switzerland. We'll meet. We'll have dinner. <coughs> well, I did that. Um, it was an interesting night. I'll leave it at that. I think I know the answer to this already. But uh, what about some of the core operators? And 
you know, what do you say or how do you <coughs> kind of, you know, look for actually out there? And what about the ethics of operating? What do you think? Well, that's an interesting yeah, question. So that, that's interesting. Um, first thing I'll say is that as far as like operators, the best operators I found from a country are Japan. Japanese operators, the Asians are phenomenal. They listen, they do what you say. The worst ones are the Europeans. And probably out of the Europeans, probably the Italians are the worst. Am I, am I wrong? No. Um, Somebody said, you know, leave it, leave it out. And, you know, 15 people come back. Not quite right. No, no. I mean, uh, again, it's, it's the spirit of the contest. You know, you, you basically, um, you, you, you want to stay within bounds. Yeah, I'll, I'll sort of leave it at that. I, I will tell you, there was a, a funny episode. Um, there was a W4. There's always a W4. There was a W4 on 10 meters who I have been operating this frequency for like three hours running people. And I basically ran the band out. And he was telling me, you're on my frequency. Well, I'm not going to have an argument with the guy. I'm, a, I'm just going to ignore him. And I just kept on working. He tried to kill me like hell. I kept on working people. I get spotted and finally he went away. So he sent VP9GE a note saying, hey, this idiot's you know, using your call sign. So of course, Ed you know, comes to me and goes, what's going on? And I explained to him, he goes, oh, never mind. You know, the people, they're, they're, they're people like that. Good job. Okay. You're welcome.